بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Sheikh Sahih Mahmoud was uh, born in England and he gained license to teach uh, license to judge us in many uh, aspects. Islamic sciences including Quran, uh, Fiqh, Hadith and the Prophet Sunnah <coughs> from various shihub. He first started education in Darul Ulum al arabiya al islamiyah uh, and then he went on to uh, al jami al Islami in Karachi. After which he went on to Darul Ulum in Newcastle, South Africa. Uh, and then he went on to do a BA in Applied Theological Studies in the University of Birmingham and taught the Adma course uh, at Medina al Ulum uh, Kidder Minister uh, for subsequently two years. For the past six years, he was a khatib at one of Birmingham's largest masjids, uh, Jamia Masjid in Ashton. And uh, without further ado, I'm just going to bring uh, Sheikh before, inshallah. Speaker system is not too good, so I'll use my own. 
You know, the problem with these introduction things is that they're outdated. I think I must have left that Jamia Masjid in Aston about 10 years ago. So, uh, why are we going to speak about the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab? I mean, one of the reasons, obviously, he was a Sahabi. He was one of the most eminent Sahaba, radiyallahu anhu. But what made Umar radiyallahu anhu very special? <coughs> and inshallah, I have no intention of uh, just giving a, a normal talk. Inshallah, hopefully we'll engage you in this as well. <laughs> what made Umar radiyallahu anhu special? Umar, in a period of ten and a half years, being the caliph, made Islam, ten and a half years, yeah? Made Islam the superpower on the face of this earth. Why? And what was Umar anhu like before Islam? When Umar anhu says himself that before Islam, I used to look after the sheep, and if I did a good job in looking after the sheep, you know, my father would sometimes give me some dates. And if I failed, then my father would beat me. And when he became the caliph, one day he stood up. He went to the pulpit and he stood up and he said, he gave a, a talk. And he said, before Islam, Omar, Amir al-Mu'mineen, who at that time was Amir al-Mu'mineen. Before Islam, I would rear sheep. I would look after the sheep on the outskirts of Medina. And if I did a good job, my father would give me some dates. And if I did not fulfill the duty, then my father would beat me. And I used to look after the sheep for my aunties from the tribe of Bani Makhzum. Who knows who the tribe of Bani Makhzum is here? The tribe of Bani Makhzum. Who belonged to the tribe of Bani Makhzum? Khalid bin Walid. Who else? Who else? Walid ibn Maghira. Abu Jahal. And others. So he, he says that I should look after the sheep for my aunties. And at the end of the day, if I fulfilled my duty, they would give me some dates and some raisins. <coughs> and then after giving this talk, he descended from the pulpit. And Abdulhamad ibn Aw said, Amir al what did you do? You only disgraced yourself. He said, you know, when the people came, and they came to me and they were listening to my speech. I began to think that Umar is something special now. And I wanted to bring myself back to earth. So therefore I reminded myself of my origins. This was Umar anhu before Islam. And then a time came that the same Umar ibn Khattab sat at the feet of the Prophet and he became the most powerful man on the face of this earth. What changed Umar And look, I'm going to make this brief because obviously this is a two and a half day course which I do. So I'm going to try to kind of condense as many pertinent <coughs> points which inshallah will be beneficial to you and myself and yourself about the life of Umar ibn Khattab <coughs> So Umar, what we want to understand is what made Umar tick. 1.5 billion Muslims and if I ask you a question, if by some miracle tomorrow 1.5 billion Muslims disappeared off the face of this earth Gone. Would humanity miss the Muslims? And I'm not talking about an individual basis. I mean, your neighbors might miss your samosas and your pokoras 
that you give to them, your kebab that you give to them on Ramadan. But as a community, as a whole, would humanity miss the Muslims? Many be throwing parties, many be celebrating, but the truth is, not really. Why? How, how did that happen? Because see, Muslims today don't embody the deen which the Prophet brought. And there's a simple reason for that. That our religion is not a catalyst for us becoming real believers. Because becoming people who are motivated has two categories. One, how you perceive your religion. Now, how do we perceive our religion today? So they say, ah, and I've, I think I mentioned this recently, but they, uh, in, in the talk that I gave Harlem, they say, ah, oh, you know, the brother is practicing. So what, when they say the brother is practicing, what do they mean? They mean the brother's got a beard. That's it. He's got a beard and the brother is practicing. That's all it needs. He may not know nothing about the deen. He may have very foul character, but he's practicing. Because he's got a beard. They say, sisters, they say, you want to marry a sister who's practicing? And I'm saying, yeah. What is the criteria for a sister practicing? You tell me. Sorry? What's that, brother? What did you say? He goes, hijab. Hijab. A sister wears a hijab and the sister is regarded as practicing. Oh, subhanallah. If that's the criteria, if that's our threshold, then we've got serious problems. <clears throat> we have serious problems. So we want to understand what made Umar radiallahu anhu tick. Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, if I knew that Umar loved a dog, I would love that dog. <coughs> Amr ibn As would say that you will never meet a man like Umar ibn Khattab. You will never meet a man like Umar ibn Khattab. Now how did it happen? And you know about the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. He was known, what was the laqab, what were the titles of Umar? Okay. He was known as? Sorry? Come on guys, brothers, Hello. sisters, Hello. don't be shy. I know the Mawlana that you studied with in your local masjid, you know, who used to batter <laughs> Yeah. Some of us still have uh, the physical scars. And if you don't have the physical scar, you surely have the psychological scars. You remember the mosque days? And they were a lot better when you were there. When we were there, you know, you should go in the mosque 5 o'clock every minute. Wait, come on. You know, and until 7 o'clock. And they were the longest two hours in your life. So, what were the laqqa, what were the titles of the Allah? Sorry? Baruch, very good. The distinguisher between the right and false. And Batil and Haq, truth and false. What else? Amir al What else? That's it. Omar, Farooq, Amir al Abu Hafs. Abu Hafs. He was known as Asla. You know what Asla means? The bold headed one. He was also known as the Imam Muslim relates a narration where the person meant Ra'itul Asla Yuqabbilu al Hajar. I saw the bold headed one kissing the Hajr Aswad. <laughs> Umar radiallahu anhu and he had a, a, a few other titles. Now Umar before Islam was a man, you know, he was a wrestler. Him, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu were amongst those who would wrestle. He, he was very tall, very powerful. The narrations mentioned that when Umar radiallahu anhu would stand with a group of people, it was though he was on a mount. That's how tall Umar ibn Khattab who was very powerful, broad person. And he was known amongst 
the people, his, his tribe, the Bani Adi, were not a strong tribe. But amongst his, the tribe of Bani Adi, they had one man who was powerful. And that was Umar radiallahu anhu. He was known for his strength. And this is why when the Prophet sallallahu came with the dawah, the Prophet sallallahu made a special dua. And that special dua was, oh Allah, assist this thee through two people. One was Umar, who was the other one? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. The second was, was Abu Jahl. Oh Allah, assist us, assist this deen through one of these two people. Either Umar ibn al-Khattab or Abu Jahl. And then in the narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, related by Mustadrak, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Make it Umar ibn al-Khattab. Subhanallah. Umar radiallahu anhu. When the mushrikeen became tired of the dawah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, they gathered and they said, we can't control this man. Many of them are migrating to Medina or to Abyssinia at that time. Who is ready to kill Muhammad? Oh, subhanallah. Who stands up? Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he leaves to go and kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on his way, he meets a man called Nu'aym ibn Abdullah. Nu'aym ibn Abdullah uh, saw Umar with his sword walking through the streets of Mecca and he said, Umar, where are you going? And Umar said, I'm going to kill Muhammad. Now he thought Nu'aym was not a Muslim. So Nu'aym said, do you think his tribe, his clan will leave you if you kill him? So Umar said, looks like you also embrace the religion. I'll start with you and then I'll deal with him. So they began to brawl. And Nu'aym said, before you deal with me and the Prophet sallallahu go and sort out your own home. Your own home. He said, your brother-in-law and your sister have embraced Islam. And Umar went and he mentions that he heard a humming noise outside the door. So he knocks on the door. And they open the door and his sister says, I saw an evil intent on my brother's face. And they took the Quran, which they were learning, and they placed it under the her thigh. And Umar radiallahu said, what was that noise I heard? And she said, what noise? He said, I've heard that you have left the religion of our forefathers. <coughs> and, and his <coughs> brother-in-law, anybody know who his brother-in-law was? Anybody know who his brother-in-law was? Anybody know who his sister's name was? That's what? Fatima. Fatima, very good. Fatima, she was one of the early ones who embraced Islam. What was his brother-in-law's name? Sayyid bin Zayd, one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah by the Prophet sallallahu Sayyid bin Zayd. He was the son of Zayd. Check out who his father was. A very interesting personality. Sayyid bin Zayd said to Umar, he said, what if the truth lied somewhere else? And Umar was a mighty man. He grabbed his brother-in-law, he dropped him to the ground, and then he started pulling his beard, and he sat on the chest. And his sister moved forward, and he slapped his sister. And the narrations mentioned that she began to believe, uh, believe. and she said, O oh, enemy of Allah, do whatever you want to do. For you will find us, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is a messenger. And you will find us firm upon this deed. Do whatever you want to do. Subhanallah. You know what they would say about Umar radiallahu anhu before Islam? They would say about Umar radiallahu anhu. They would say that there is more chance that his that his father's donkey will embrace Islam than Umar will embrace Islam. More chance that his father's donkey will embrace Islam than Umar of the Allah will embrace Islam. And the narration mentioned that, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the heart of man is in the two fingers of Rahman, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turns it however he wishes. So Umar radiallahu anhu, all of a sudden, after striking his sister, felt a remorse. So he said, bring me, bring me the paper. So they 
bring him the paper, the Qur'an, and he begins to recite it. And it starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And now the Arab Mushrikeen had no concept of ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They would say Bismik Allahumma. So the narration mentioned he read it Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and he threw it on the ground. And then he picked it, composed himself, he picked it up again. And with great difficulty he passed the word ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And he began to recite Surah Al-Taha. And subhanallah, the more he read, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his heart. And Allah opened his heart to the degree that he stopped. And he turned towards his sister. And he said, is this what the Makkans have been running away from? And then he began to recite more and more. Until Allah opened his heart and he said to his sister, tell me, where is Muhammad? And she said he's in Darul Arqam. Now Darul Arqam was a house which was, you could say, the first madrasa in the history of Islam. It was at the mount, the foot of the mountain of Safa. And Umar radiallahu anhu made his way. And Hamza and some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were in the house. And when some of the Sahaba saw Umar coming, they hid. And Hamza radiallahu anhu was a very mighty warrior. And he had embraced Islam only three days before this. And Hamza said, don't fear, if Umar has come with khair, alhamdulillah, if not, then we will kill him with his own sword. The door. And Hamza radiallahu anh, opened the door, and one sahaba grabbed one arm, and the other sahabi grabbed another arm. And they brought him in. And the narration mentioned that the Prophet wasallam said, leave him, release him. And they released him. And then the Prophet wasallam grabbed his garment. And he said, oh, Umar, when will you heed? When will you heed? And Umar fell to his feet. And he said, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and you are his messenger. And it was from that day that Umar was counted. It was from that day that Umar was counted. If Umar had not embraced Islam, Umar would have been many many of the other Arabs, most likely he would have been in the ranks of people like Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, SubhanAllah. It was after that day, Umar anhu eventually became Amir al-Mu'mineen. And when he came after he embraced Islam, he said, O Messenger of Allah, tell me, are we in the truth? And the Prophet said, yes. He said, tell me, if one of us died in spreading the religion, do we enter into paradise? And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, yes. And he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? SubhanAllah, you know, today, people, if you look at the ancestors of Islam, Wallahi, they died, they gave their lives to spread in the message. And today, we can't even speak to our neighbor. We can't even speak to our friend. You know, we feel embarrassed. Why do we feel embarrassed? The reason we feel embarrassed, the truth is that there is no real deep belief. There is no real deep belief. If there was a belief, it would motivate you. <laughs> you, know, you would have that concern. And Umar said, Umar anhu said, O Messenger of Allah, if we're on the truth, then let's spread the deen. And the Prophet Sallallahu gave him the permission and the Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, we were proud when Umar embraced Islam. Because now we could come and practice openly. We could pray salah by the Kaaba. And it was on this occasion, for this reason, Umar radiallahu anhu was given the title as Al-Farooq. Al-Farooq. The one who distinguishes between right and wrong. And Ali radiallahu anhu says that every single other Sahabi, when they migrated, they did it secretly. Every other Sahabi besides Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar was known. The narration mentioned that Umar anhu came to the Kaaba. And all the chieftains of the Quraysh used to sit around the Kaaba. You know, they used to like chill out. You know, like nowadays, you chill out in shisha houses. You have shisha houses here? Plenty of them. You have any shisha houses? We don't know. No. There's a couple. Well, in Birmingham, they just, all day long, 
see shisha houses. Smoke, and then subhanAllah, some of them go to the masjid, and then they come back. Yeah, this is what Muslims are meant to be doing. Muslims don't have time. <coughs> Muslims are meant to be, you know, motivated people. <laughs> Muslims are trying to affect a change. How do you have time hanging around in shisha houses? So Umar radiallahu came to the leaders, the mushrikeen, and he said to the mushrikeen, the leader chieftains, he said, let me tell you, tell you that me and Umar, I'm going to migrate to Medina. And if anybody wants his wife to become a widow and his children to become an orphan, then meet me behind the van. And nobody moved. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, he he prayed leisurely, then he prayed two rakats, and then he migrated. And nobody stood in the way of Umar Nur Khattab of the Allah. And then, as I said, I want to go more into the Khalifat of Umar Nur Khattab of the Allah. He stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On every expedition, he was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left this dunya, and he was pleased with Umar Nur Khattab. And then he stayed in the Khalifat of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu left this dunya, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was pleased with Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, he said, I saw a dream that Abu Bakr is taking out water from the well. And he takes out one or two weekly. And then Umar comes. And he says that bucket becomes a huge bucket. And Omar takes out, he takes out the water. And everybody is satiated. Everybody drinks from it. They are satiated. And people go home content. And this was an indication, Imam Shafi rahimahullah says, that not that he was better than Abu Bakr, no. That his caliphate would be one of prosperity. This is what Umar radiallahu anhu was like. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu became Amir al Mu'mini, and then he had a concern. You know, every single evening, Umar radiallahu anhu would walk around in the community. Every evening. Because why? Because let me tell you who a leader is. You know, who, who a real leader is. A real leader is that person who serves other people. The Prophet ﷺ says, Sayyidu Qawmi Khadimuhum. That the leader of any group of people is the one that serves them. And then the Prophet ﷺ said in an amazing narration, he said, the only reward greater than serving other people is to die for a just cause. To die in the path of Allah. Only reward which is greater than serving other people. Now today, where is this khidmah? Where's, where's this thing about serving other people? As religious people, we don't even regard it as a part of the deen. But Umar, subhanAllah, Umar radiallahu anhu would go out every evening. He would have aslam with him, sometimes with Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And upon occasion, Umar radiallahu anhu went out. With him was Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Abdurrahman ibn Auf was who? He was the one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was also a multi-millionaire. Multi-millionaire. And you know his sister was married to who? His sister was married to Bilal radiallahu anhu. He was from the Quraysh, a multi-millionaire, and his sister was married to Bilal radiallahu anhu. SubhanAllah, Bilal was a slave, a freed slave. But for the Sahaba, it did not matter. For them, they looked at characteristics. This thing about, you know, this own, this nation. That's, that's an issue that Muslims are serious, a serious problem. So he took Abdurrahman ibn Auf and a group of people came into the vicinity. And Umar radiallahu anhu said to Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he said, let's look after these people all night. Him and Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu remained in the company of these people. Until it was what time? Until 
you know, a good portion of the night had passed, and there was a child amongst them which kept on crying. And Umar anhu said to the mother, he said, you know, look after your child, why is he crying for? And then later on in the night, the child still crying. And Umar anhu came again, and he said, what an evil mother you are. All night your child cried, why didn't you look after him? And she said, she didn't know this is Umar. She said, Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab has stipulated an allowance for those children who are weaned off. And I'm trying to wean my child off. And then Umar anhu asked her how old her child was. She told him. And then Umar anhu said, don't hasten. And then Umar anhu and the Fajr Salah, in the Fajr Salah, the nation mentioned, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf mentioned, he said, I swear by Allah, Umar cried so much. Umar cried so much that we could not understand what he was reciting in the Fajr Salah. And then after the Fajr Salah, Umar turned around and Umar said to himself, he said, Woe unto you, Umar, how many children have you killed due to this law of yours? And then he made the stipulate that every child in the Muslim world which was born would be given an allowance. Child benefit started with the Muslims. Umar started child benefit. Now Cameron wants to stop it. Muslims have a serious problem. Muslims are the biggest families. A lot of them sit in shisha houses because they live off family credit and child benefit. So Umar stipulated a family allowance a child benefit for every single person. Anybody who could not work in the Muslim world was given an allowance. Was disabled. Disabled. Umar anhu saw a group of Christians. Subhanallah. They suffered from leprosy. Umar anhu took out wealth from the Baytul Mal and he gave them he spent on them to cure them. And those who could not be cured, Umar spent on them until their final days. Umar once saw a Jewish man, he was, he was begging. And Umar called the governor and he said, why is this man begging for? He said, all his life he's paid taxes, now he can't fend for himself. Why is he begging? And this is why Umar, four days before he passed away, you know, Abdul, he said to Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he said to Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he said, oh, Hudayfa, by Allah, if I live until next year, no woman in Iraq will need any man besides Umar ibn Khattab. I will provide for every single woman in Iraq. Now, I ask you, when, how did this become religion? For us, this ain't religion. For us, the beard and the hijab, and a bit of salah, and a bit of tilawat al Quran, and dhikr, that's a, that, that is deen. How did this become deen? Because this is a thing, we have restricted religion to a few rituals. And this wasn't what the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were like. like. Every Sahabi was made in the masjid, but he wasn't made for the masjid. Today, we are made, if we go to the masjid, slightly by the masjid, only for the four walls of the masjid. So any outreach work, we don't do it. This is not religion. Any khidmah of people is not religion. The man was a multi-millionaire, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. The Prophet wasallam gave a guarantee, gave a guarantee that Abdul Rahman ibn Awf would go into Jannah. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Prophet wasallam said, if there was a Prophet to come after me, it would have been Umar ibn al-Khattab. The Prophet ﷺ said, if I walk down, if Umar walks down one path, shaitan can never take that path. The Prophet ﷺ said, last night I entered into Jannah and I saw this beautiful white palace. And I asked the angel, who does this palace belong to? And they said, it belongs to Umar ibn Khattab. And the Prophet ﷺ said, oh, I turned to Umar. He said, Umar, I wanted to enter it, but I remembered your ghayra. And Umar radiallahu anhu began to cry. And he said, Umar, ghayra from you. Men were guaranteed Jannah. But they spent the entire night doing what? Looking after. Why? Fundamental. Because their religion motivated. 
And that's the reality. You know, we, we would speak about, you know, liberating Afghanistan, Palestine, Iraq, you know, closing Guantanamo Bay until the depths of the night. To the depths of the night. And come Fajr Salah, our hero can't wake up. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that you, you can't speak about Guantanamo Bay if you don't pray your Salah. No, but there's a thing called priorities. You show me when Sahabi who did not pray. Omar was on the opinion, and this is where the humblies get it from. Anybody who doesn't praise out the fold, that was Omar's opinion. But see, the religion motivated them. It motivated Umar. And this is why we don't, wallahi, I, 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 this is no exaggeration. No, people don't understand the Sahaba. People don't understand Umar ibn al-Khattab. How did you, in a matter period of ten and a half years, take down a superpower which lasted for 1,200 years? The Persians were a superpower for 1,200 years. You had the Byzantines, the Eastern European forces. How did he take them down in a period of 10 and a half years? And then what did he do? He bought a system. Very few people embraced Zoroastrianism, the Persian religion. Or very few, few more embraced Christianity. But when Islam came, the vast majority of that area embraced Islam. Why? Because they, they didn't see him as conquerors. They saw these people, they had something different about them. They would provide. And this is why Umar would go out. Nobody will remain hungry in the 18th year of Hijrah, Amu Ramada. Umar this was known as the year of the ashes. There was a famine in Makkah, Medina area. And the nation said, they say, by Allah, Omar would say, if I can't feel the pain of other people, I will not be able to appreciate it. And they say, and the narrations mention, they say, by Allah, if, if the famine had remained another year, Omar would have died. His eyes sank in. His complexion became dark. <coughs> he became weak. Because he felt, he felt for other people. And this is why he would walk around the streets doing the khidmah of other people. The narration mentioned that he went to the outskirts about three miles from Medina. And when he reached about three miles from Medina, he saw this woman with her children. And the children are crying around her. And she's cooking something. And Umar anhu said, he said, he walked up to her and he gave her salam. And he said, can I come close? And she said, yes. And then Umar said, what are you cooking? She said, I have nothing to cook. What I have on this fire is water. Because my children are crying out of hunger. And I hope that they think mum is cooking something and they will fall asleep. And Umar began to speak to her. And then Umar anhu said, What do you think about Umar ibn al-Khattab? What do you think about Umar ibn al-Khattab? And she said, I complain to Allah about Umar ibn al-Khattab. <coughs> I complain to Allah about Umar ibn al-Khattab. But he said, he said, Umar anhu said, Maybe Umar doesn't know your state. And she said, he's a Khalifa, he's a Amir, and he doesn't know the state of his subjects. And this, you know, pierced the heart of Umar radiallahu anhu. And the narration mentioned that Umar went, he went to the Bayt al-Mal and he told the keeper, he said, give me a sack full of food. And the keeper bought a sack full of food and Umar said, place on my back. And the keeper said, oh, Mir al let me carry it. And Umar said, place on my back. And he said, oh, Mir al let me carry it. And Umar, when he said it the third time, Umar became angry. And he said, أَتَحْمِلُ عَنِّي ذُنُوبِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, will you carry my sins also on the day of judgment? And then Umar carried the sack, who was at that time the most powerful man on the face of this earth. He carried the sack through Medina until he reached the tent. And the narration mentioned he lit the fire by himself and the smoke was going through his beard. And then he cooked the food himself. And then he began to feed the children. And the woman sitting there, she doesn't know that this is Umar ibn Khattab. And she said, I swear by Allah, you are better than Umar ibn Khattab. <laughs> and then Abdul Rahman ibn Auf says, 
that it was dark, it was cold, and I said to Umar, I said, Amir al Mu'mineen, it's cold, it's dark, let's go back. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, no. He said, I swear by Allah, I will not remove, I will not move from this place until I see the children laughing like I saw them crying. And then Abdul Rahman ibn Awf says, he said, I, I cannot express to you how Umar cried in the Fajr Salah because he had seen people crying out of hunger. Today we see people dying out of hunger. We see Muslims dying out of hunger. But we don't have the, no, the Imam, the motivation doesn't allow us to put our hands in our pockets. Why? Because we've got these aspirations. And these aspirations which never finish. These aspirations which never finish. You know, you have a car, you have a bicycle, and you want a car, and then you got a bigger car, and then a bigger car, and it never finishes. You know, you have a house, and, and, the, and people are starving to death. You're going to take, and all of us understand, are you going to take your car with you into your grave? <laughs> One thing that you are guaranteed that you're going to take in your grave is your actions. How you spent your life. And this is what motivated the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. What motivated the people like Umar ibn Khattab was that there was a react. They believed. They believed. They had a firm conviction. They sat at the feet of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How can you now, if you become a leader, it's like you know you, you have a luxurious life. Umar, Hafsa radiallahu anhu had his daughter and the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She entered the house of Umar. And Umar, you know, lived, he, he lived very simply. He lived in a mud hut. And she said, oh my father, you know, great wealth has come into the Muslim land. Then why don't you have some luxuries? And Umar radiallahu anhu said, oh Hafsa, you're the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Tell me, tell me, how did the message of Allah live? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to Umar, when Umar radiallahu anhu entered his house, he saw the Prophet sallallahu there was nothing in the house of the Prophet sallallahu And the Prophet sallallahu was lying on a mat. And when he sat up, he, there were imprints of the mat on his back. And, then, and he began to cry and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, look at the opulence which the Persian and the, and the Roman emperors live in. You know the message of Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu sat up and he said, Oh Umar, even you, even you, have you not understood? That my example is like a person who takes shade under a tree and then he moves on. A person who had made this abode permanent. Tell me one person who chose to come into this world. Tell me one person who chose at his time to leave this dunya. Nobody. And that's the reality. That's the reality of life. Nobody. You come in voluntarily, you leave in voluntarily. But then Allah says about the part, the, the dunya, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ You get deluded because it's the now. And everybody around you speaking about the now. Everybody around you speaking about, you know, climbing the ladder of success. What is the ladder of success? Yes. How do they define you? You put on your TV st station and you have programs like The Apprentice. She knows what she wants. She, she'll trod on anybody's toes to attain what he or she wants. So that's the culture that we imbibe. Because that's the current, the antithesis to what we really believe. We believe, like Allah says, they give preference to others. Why? Because they believe that they're going to stand in front of Allah. They believe that you know life is temporal. And that's what Umar, people like Umar ibn Khattab they understood this. They understood their responsibility to humanity. What happened with the Muslims? And this is the reality. Religion is defined with what? Amongst us, do we regard any social work as a part of deed? How many soup kitchens do Muslims have in Sheffield? The Christians have soup kitchens. We, we Muslims don't do that stuff. And if you look at the beginning of this deen, the vast majority of people who embraced this religion were who? 
There were poor people. There were people like Bilal. The greatest objection that the leader, the Mushrikeen had, was that we can't sit with these people, they're low lives. So they were said to the Prophet Sallallahu they said, okay, have one day for them and one day for us, then we'll embrace Islam. And Allah intervened. Allah said they will stay because they have a ragba. What did the religion do? The religion created hope for those who had no hope. And today we don't do this. Omar is saying, he said, I swear by Allah, I will ensure that the Bedouins in the mountains of Sana'a will get their allowance. They will get their allowance. For Sayyidina Yahbu and other Sahaba who were blind, he actually had a carer. He had a carer to look after these people. Why? Because they regarded this as part of deen. What's the general, what's the, what's the general you know, discussion amongst Muslims nowadays? It's where you place your hands. The vast majority, you know, you go into the masjid and they're just disputing on issues. Disputing on issues like salah, how to pray salah. You know, how to, how to do zakat, give zakat. These issues have been resolved 1400 years ago. But the truth is, you know why Muslims, you go to the average masjid, they never speak about any social reach, any outward, out outreach plan. And the working in the community, working with the youngsters, bringing them to the masjid, any thou or why? Because we get embroiled in these little nitty gritty fifty issues which make us feel good. The truth is, you know why? Because the truth is you and me know that we can't deal with the issues outside. We can't deal with the issues outside, the problems that we have. And therefore we get involved on these nitty gritty and people like Umar ibn Khattab, you know, they sat with the Prophet These people had a vision. They were people who had a vision. And they had this concern. Umar in every single governor. Look how Umar had it. Every, oh, Umar, he demoted. Who did he demote? Let me tell you the Sahaba. Generally when they say, oh, he demoted Khalid bin Walid. He didn't just demote Khalid bin Walid. You know who he demoted? He demoted Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah. He demoted Amr ibn al As. He demoted <coughs> Al ibn Hadrami. He demoted Mu'abi radiallahu anhu. He, he, he didn't demote him, but he, he rebuked him on a number of occasions. He demoted Ammar ibn Yasir. How can you demote Badri Sahaba? How can you demote these who are guaranteed Jannah? You know why? Because Umar had standards. And these, you have to live up to the standards, and this is why Umar anhu achieved what he did. Today what happens, somebody becomes the mirror of the masjid, <coughs> he's going to be there until the day he dies. That mosque committee will remain there. We speak about, you know, why, what's wrong with these Muslim leaders? Why don't they leave their throne? SubhanAllah, you got to take the masjid committee, you don't want to get off the masjid committee. At least this guy's got a whole country that he look at. He, he has you a, a masjid and you will never leave the throne of that masjid. Islamic societies, and I don't know about Islamic society, but if you are in charge of the Islamic society, you know, you should regard it as a responsibility. You know, that you are accountable. Tell me one Sahabi who ever took a role that he wanted. Abu Dhar came to the Prophet and he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, make me a governor. And Prophet said, no. We don't give to those who want. But we check those people who have the ability. And we utilize those who have the ability. Umar was once sitting and a person came. And Maghir ibn Shoba came into the gathering and Umar was sitting and he seemed very concerned. And he said, and Maghir ibn Shoba said, Amir oh, al what's wrong? He said, you know, Whenever there's a post, I always see two types of people. Two types of people. One is that person who has, who, who is very pious, but he doesn't have the ability to motivate people. He can't organize things. On the other hand, I have another person who's not pious to the same degree, but he has the ability to motivate people and he organizes well. 
Who's, I don't know who to give the role to. I don't know who to give the role to. And they said, give it to the one who can organize one. And the Umar said, why? He said, because the one with the piety, piety, his piety is limited to himself. But his inability to organize, motivate people has an impact on everybody else. So the one whose piety is not to the same degree, that's also limited to himself. But his ability to organize and motivate people, he's got a get up and go. It will impact everyone. And this is why, you know, the old students here, Wallahi, I, I personally believe that the most, the time when actually the vast majority of people's life change is at university. You have plenty of time. You know, if you're, if you're not local, you're from, you've got plenty, you're in the campus, you've got time to think. You know, you've got time and you've got either one, either, you know, you can just chill out with the rest, you know, no nightclubbing, no womanizing. But I've seen many people who have this, if the Islamic society is motivated, if the brothers have a concern, they change people's lives. They change people's lives. But on the other hand, if you're not assisting the Islamic society, then you have no right to criticize people. Because Muslims are very good armchair Christians. We do nothing, we do nothing, but we're always pointing the finger. Oh, the Amir of the Islamic society isn't good enough. Omar anhu would say, regarding any issue, he said, if there's no mashwara, there's no khair in it. Now, Omar was a person, strong personality, strong character. General. So why would Omar, every issue he would do mashwara? He had people sent all, Christians and Persians sent all the way from Iraq so he could do mashwara with them. Why? Why, why would Omar need to do mashwara when he was a strong personality? The Prophet said, you know, haq runs from the tongue of Umar ibn al-Khattar. Karaki says, in 16 places, Allah agreed with the opinion of Umar ibn Khattab. In the Quran, many verses were revealed according to the opinion of Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar is saying, do mashwara. Why? I ask you. If he was a person, why did he need to do mashwara? Because this mashwara is something, consulting other people is something very important. You. You will need it in your life if you want to do khayr. Anybody tell me. Okay, understand them as a group. Okay, you could make a mistake. Okay, you mistake, very good. Huh? United, that's very good. United the hearts of people. See, normally now you say, man, man's got a strong character, yeah? He's got a strong opinion. What does that mean? Now, Umar was a man who was strong character. Nobody had a stronger character. But nowadays they say, he's got a, yeah, he's, he's got a strong opinion. It means he listens to nobody. <coughs> Often it means he, got, he listens to nobody. He's a strong character. Umar was a strong character. But why did he move mashwara? See, he did mashwara because he wanted his opinion to be the best. And secondly, see, people who have a backbone, they don't mind listening to other people's opinions. People who, you know, who are not confident, who are insecure, they don't want to hear anybody else's opinions. And Umar anhu, he, he, he would bring into the mashwara, he, he would bring all types of people into the mashwara. <coughs> all types. He did mashwara with the Jews, the Christians, he had said all the way from Iraq to Medina. In the battlefield, he would say to the Sahaba, he said, consult Tulayha and Amr ibn Madiq al-Rabb. Why? Because these were two warriors. You know, what, what did that show? Umar used people who had potential in their field, who were specialists in their field. He utilized them. He utilized them. And this, this is what Umar created. He would take into, he would say, consult everybody, consult the young people as well. <coughs> consult the young people as well, because you do not know where the khayr is. 
Umar would often come out of the masjid, people would stop Umar radiallahu Upon occasion, this lady stopped the Umar radiallahu anh. And she said to Umar, she said, oh, Umar, you must always fear Allah. I remember the days that you were Umayyad. Umayyad means the small Umar. And you used to run around the marketplace, and then you became Umar. And today you have become Umar al-Mu'mineen. And somebody said, oh lady, take it easy on the man. And Omar said, be quiet. He said, let her carry on. Let her carry on. And then she, she carried on. And then Omar said, I swear by Allah, if this lady spoke to me from morning to evening, I would not leave this place, decide to go and pray Salah. He said, do you know who this lady is? This lady is the lady when she complained about her husband. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, قَدْ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّذِي Allah has heard the words of that woman who complains about her husband. She argues with you and she complains about her husband. Allah said, Umar said, if Allah can hear her words, who is Umar ibn Khattab? Now you all know how powerful Umar was. And the Sahabi narrates that my father came into Medina as he was a Sahabi, he said, my father came into Medina, Umar anhu, bought some sheep of him. And my next day my father said, I want my money. And Umar said, I'll pay you later on. And he says that, that my father grabbed Umar and he punched him in the chest. He punched him in the chest. He himself narrates that Umar was shadeed. He was a strong man. But Umar did nothing to him. Umar forgave him. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this was the justice of Umar ibn Khattab. Now, Umar, look, Umar only gave positions to those people who were just. This was Umar. Upon occasion, you know, a man came, and one of the governors of Umar radiallahu and he was kissing a child. And you know what Umar was like before Islam. They say that Umar radiallahu would often smile and laugh for no reason. And sometimes he would cry for no reason. And somebody one day plucked up the courage and they said, Umar al why is it that sometimes you see laughing for no reason and sometimes crying for no reason? And Umar radiallahu anhu said, before Islam, in the days of Jahiliyyah, you know, the Makkans believed that the idols of Makkah were the most precious idols. So one day we were on a journey and we had no idol for Makkah. So what we did, we had dates from Makkah. So out of the dates, we carved a god out of the dates. And later on, when our provisions became exhausted, and we got hungry, we began to dissect god. So we took off his ear, and we began to eat his ear, took off his nose, began to eat his nose. And sometimes when I remember this, I begin to cry. Sorry, I begin to laugh. How stupid we were. And so the reason I cry is that before in the days of Jahiliyyah, before Islam, I had a daughter. And this daughter loved me like any daughter loved her father. And the Arabs had this culture. Some Arabs and some tribes had this culture. He said, one day I took her to the corner of the city and I began to dig a ditch. And she began to dig a ditch. And then I took, and then I, I took my own blood and I threw her into the ditch. And then I began to fill up the ditch, dig, bury my own daughter alive. She was crying, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, oh my father, oh my father. And sometimes when I remember this, I begin to cry. And then Umar embraced Islam. He sat at the feet of the greatest of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the time came that Umar became Amir al-Mu'mineen and he was kissing a child. And one of his governors came in. And he said, Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, you kiss children. You kiss children. Umar radiallahu sat with the Prophet sallallahu The Arabs before Islam didn't kiss children. It was not regarded as macho. It wasn't regarded as macho. You're not a man. You know, you're a man if you can batter somebody. You're a man if you look big. You're not a man if you do khidmah for other people. If you go serve other people. No, no, that's not macho. So the, the, the man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, his Prophet Sallallahu was kissing his grandchild. And he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, you kiss children. 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, he said, don't you get children? He said, no, I've got ten. Ten. And he said, I'll never kiss one of them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Awa amliku lak. Awa amliku lak He said, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do for you when Allah has removed rahmah from your heart? When Allah has removed rahmah from your heart, Allah has removed mercy from your heart. And, and the governor came and Umar was kissing a child and he said, Oh, Mir al you kiss children. He said, Yes. He said, Don't you kiss children? No, me. When I enter the house, it's locked down. <laughs> Nobody moves. <laughs> Even the goldfish stops swimming. <laughs> And Umar radiallahu removed him from his post. He removed him from his post. He says, those who are harsh upon their families should never have a post amongst the Muslims. Those who are harsh upon their families should not have a post amongst the Muslims. On another occasion, Umar radiallahu a man came to Umar radiallahu And Umar, and he knocked on the door. And he came to complain about his wife. He knocked on the door. And then he heard Umar being scolded by his own wife. So he, decided, he walked away. So Umar opened the door. And he said, why did you come for? He said, nothing, oh, Amir al He said, no, tell me, why did you come for? He said, no reason, Amir al He said, I asked you by Allah, why did you come? So on the third time, he said, you know what? I came to complain about my wife. But when I saw your say, I thought I'm having a good. <laughs> How is that good? Uh -uh. And Umar radiallahu anhu, anhu said, Listen, these are our wives. They look after our children. They cook, they clean. Is it not befitting for a believer to be good to his wife? Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu said, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli, wa ana khayrukum li ahli. The best of you is he who is best to his family. And I am the best to my family. Imam Tirmidhi, I know why I'm talking to you guys about marriage anyway, you guys are not married. Yeah, maybe by the time you, I finish your talk, you'll be keen to get married. But you're not, you know, so in, an, in another narration, but when you do get married, yeah, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that, in the relation Imam Tirmidhi, if the entirety of you, don't get married brother, the entirety of humanity thinks that you are good. But your family do not think that you're good. In the eyes of Allah, you are no good. And, and if the entirety of humanity thinks that you're bad, but your family think you're good, but they're the ones that deal with you day and day. In the eyes of Allah, you're good. Omar, one good person, he testified for another person. You know, he, he vouched for another person. And Omar said to him, he said, tell me, do you know him? Do you know him? He said, yeah. He said, how do you know him? You done business with him? He said, no, I never done business with him. Do you travel with him? He said, no, I never travel with him. He said, then what? Maybe you saw him in the masjid and you said, he goes, yeah, I saw him in the masjid. He goes, then you don't know him. Because everybody looks good in the masjid. Everybody looks good in the university. Hi, how you doing? Salam alaikum. Walaikum salam, brother. Oh, mashallah. Ask the family. Ask the family what he's like. Ask his brothers. Ask his sisters. You know, even in universities, this is this is the amazing thing. You know, you you, you have this mentality. You know, everybody should treat my sister well. How do you treat other people, sister? <coughs> if somebody spoke to your sister like that, or somebody, you know, did what you do to other people, sister, how would you feel? <coughs> Subhanallah. And Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً You know, the, the believers are brothers. And Umar radiallahu anhu, Shifa bint Abdullah, looks into this, Shifa bint Abdullah, was a lady that Umar radiallahu anhu employed. He would do mashwara with this lady. She was exceptionally intelligent. And Umar radiallahu anhu made her in charge of the marketplace. He made her in charge of the marketplace. She, she would run matters in the marketplace. And Qur'aji, and Ibn Hazm mentioned this, and Ibn Abdul Bar mentioned this, but they say that Umar would take people who were the best for the duty. And he would utilize them for the duty. Now, you know, you can go on about the life of Umar al-Muqatta. Wallahi, 
on and on. The man was exceptional. It wasn't just the fact that he started the welfare system, he started child benefit, you know, he brought down the two superpowers, of, he liberated that part of the world, he motivated people. He, he was just, the justice was unparalleled. Amr ibn As was who? Let me tell you who Amr ibn As was. Amr ibn As was regarded amongst the people of Makkah uh, before Islam and after Islam as the think tank. He embraced Islam on the same day Khalid bin Walid embraced Islam. When they embraced Islam, the Prophet said, Makkah has thrown away its liver. This is how influential the Khalid bin Walid and Amr ibn As were, people of Makkah. <coughs> but when he became the governor of Egypt, <coughs> and Omar's son drank, Omar's son drank, and his son came and he said, I drank, you know, whip me. So Amr <coughs> says, I didn't want to whip him in public. So I whipped him in the courtyard of my house. He said, Omar found out. And Omar wrote a letter to Amr ibn As and he said, Omar ibn As, I didn't know you were so brave in front of me. He said, because it's my own son, you didn't whip him publicly. He said, send him. Send him to Medina. He sent his son, Umar's son to Medina and Umar whipped his son in public. On another occasion, Umar's, uh, Amr ibn As's son and, and one of the, the Kipti, one of the Coptic Christians, they had, they had a horse race. And now Umar is the Amir of Egypt. His son had a horse race with a Christian. The Christian horse won, his son got angry and he slapped him. The Christian complained to Umar ibn Khattab. Umar called the son, called the son and Umar ibn As all the way from Egypt. And then he called the Christian. And he asked him, he said, do you slap him? He said, beat him like he beat you. He allowed the Christian to beat the son of Umar ibn As. And then Umar radiallahu anhu turned towards the Christian and he said, now beat Umar. Because the only reason his son beat you was because he was the son of Amr ibn As. And he said, beat him as well. And the Christian said, Amir al-Mu'minin, I'll beat him, the one who beat me. And then Umar radiallahu anhu turned to Amr ibn As and he said, oh, Amr, since when did you start taking people as your slave? And the mothers bore them as free men. They were born as free men. Wallahi, and I don't have the time. You know, because just regarding the governor's Umar ibn Khattab, I take two to three hours. You know, Umar was so strict with his governors. So they had, they would have to be at court all the time. No governor had the right to have a gate in front of his house. <coughs> Saad ibn Abi Waqqas was the governor of Kufa. And he lived by the marketplace and he put a gate outside his house. And Omar radiallahu found out. And Omar sent a man, Muhammad ibn Maslama, all the way from Medina to Kufa. And he said, take, when you reach there, take Saad. So who was Saad? Let me tell you who Saad was. Saad was the man, who, one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah. He was the Khal, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In relation, far relation, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the first man to shoot an arrow in the history of Islam. He was known as Mustajabu Dawa. His dua would be accepted. He said, I, after the Prophet ﷺ made a dua for me, never did I make a dua, but my dua was accepted. On the battle of Uhud, he shot a thousand arrows when the, when, when the Mushrikeen were attacking the Muslims. A thousand arrows. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him a thousand times, may my mother and my father be sacrificed. Ali radiallahu anhu says, for no other sahabi did the Prophet sallallahu combine between his mother and his father. For some he said, may my father be sacrificed for you. For others he said, may my mother be sacrificed for you. For only Sa'ad did he combine between his mother and father. A thousand times. And Sa'ad had a gate made. Omar said, Muhammad ibn Maslama all the way. From Medina to Kufa. And he said, take Saad out of his house. 
Make him sit down. Then take off the gate and burn it in front of him. If you have a responsibility, you're at the call of people. And this is why the Muslims, Wallah, let me tell you, this is why the Muslims achieve what they achieve. Now, I know better than you. Yeah? But the truth is that we need to get motivated. If you want a change, or if you want the Muslims' situation to change, the Muslims need to get motivated. And the way you get motivated, as I said, two. One, how you understand your religion. Because you can be practicing, but you can be talking, you know, the nitty, gritty, tricky issues for 20 years. And the second is your belief in Allah. Your belief in Allah. Do you really believe? If you believe, then that will motivate you. What you are studying, you will be studying with, uh, uh, with an intention that sooner or later you want to do the khidmah of people. You want to serve people. You want to, it's not just my responsibility or the local Mawlana's responsibility. You will go into your grave and the Mawlana will go into his grave. And the only thing which will remain with you is what Allah says in the Quran, La tansa nasibaka min dunya Do not forget your portion of the dunya. What's your portion of the dunya? Your actions. Your actions. That is the only thing that me and you will take to our graves. And we want to be people who on the day of judgment who stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who, who do actions which are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if you if you look at people who came before us look at look at you know people that come how many people even my age your age you know, pass away. There's no guarantee about tomorrow. There's no guarantee about tomorrow. But what, one guarantee there is that me and you are going to leave this dunya. And when we leave this dunya, I ask you, and me and you, if we were to die tomorrow, are me and you happy with what we have done with our lives? Are we happy? Are we satisfied that we can stand in front of Allah and we can say to Allah, you know, because on one side you're going to have men like the Sahaba, the Salaf al salihi You're going to have people, you know, in the, in, in, in the, in many, even today you find people in the poor third world country, how strong their belief is in Allah. Why, why Allah? You should have people who save their entire lives to be able to do Hajj and Umrah. Entire lives, they say. There was that Islam channel run that story about a couple who had been saving for 20 years, 20 years to do uh, uh, Hajj, and they had been eating, you know, f food which was very just like cr uh, uh, things like chapatis. So the taxi driver stopped, and he and he saw the food that they're eating, and he and he bought them some meat, and they said, "We can't eat this." We haven't tasted it for years. We haven't tasted it for years. If we try it, it's going to mess up our, uh, our digestion system. 20 years? Look at Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Read the life of Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Abdullah ibn Mubarak anhu, was regarded as the man, you know, he was a scholar above the rest. And the narration mentioned he lived in Merv. And he was going for Hajj. He, he, upon occasion, he went for Hajj. And after the Hajj, he had a dream. And the angels came and they said, How many people did Hajj? And they gave the number. And how many people the Hajj was accepted? And the angel, one angel said to the other, None besides a man called Abdullah ibn Muqaffal who lives in Damascus. And he didn't even come for Hajj. He didn't even come for Hajj. And Abdullah Mubarak woke up and he began to shake. See, Abdullah Mubarak is that man, for those who understand Islamic history, Abdullah Mubarak is that man that every single Imam in the history of Islam has been criticized by somebody or the other. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, Imam Bukhari, Tirmidhi. The only guy who was never disparaged was Abdullah Ibn Mubarak. This was the status of Abdullah Ibn Mubarak. 
And Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, narration mentioned, he, he hurried to Damascus and uh, he saw in the dream that this man, Abdullah ibn Muqaffal, was a cobbler. So he went and he found, he asked around and they said he lived over there. He knocked on the door and he said, are you Abdullah ibn Muqaffal? And he said, yes. I said, are you a cobbler? He said, yes. He said, tell me. He said, I saw this dream that so many people came for Hajj. Nobody's Hajj was accepted besides your Hajj. And you didn't even come for Hajj. They said to him, you know, I am a cobbler. For the last 20 years, I have been saving up money to come for Hajj. 20 years I have been saving up to come for Hajj. And I had saved enough and I wanted to come this year. And my wife was pregnant. And my neighbor was cooking meat. And you know pregnant women, when they want something, they want it food wise, they want it there and then. She smelled the meat and she said, bring me, ask the neighbors for some food. He said, I went and I knocked on the door. And this lady opened and I, and I asked her, I said, you know, my wife would like some meat that you're cooking. And she said, it's halal for me, it's haram for you. Is it halal for you and haram for me? How's that? He said, for days my children haven't eaten anything. And he said, she said, we were on the street and we saw a dead donkey. And I cut the meat from the dead donkey and I brought that home and I cooked it. So it's halal for us because we are Islam. It's haram for you. Abdullah ibn Muqaffal went downstairs to his flat. He took all the money that he had gathered for the Hajj and he gave it to the lady. He said, this is my Hajj. He said, this is my Hajj. And this had such an impact on Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, that he would, she was traveling from Merv. He lived in Merv. Imam Ahmad al Hanbal was from Merv as well. He was traveling from Merv all the way for, for Hajj. And he, and he passed about by a village and they traveled for weeks. There's no PIA or Saudi or British Airways in those days. <coughs> and there was, when they stopped, they heard some crying from a certain house. And he said, don't find out why they crying. And they went there and they said that there's old parents and they have two daughters and they don't have enough to marry off their daughters and the family were crying at their lot, at their state the narration mentioned Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah all the money that he had he gave it to them he turned on his heels and went back to birth went back to birth why? because people regard this as a part of their they regarded that to serve other people and this in no way, in no way should anybody take this as thing that the hijab, the niqab, the, the bed, the salah is... No, these are fundamentals. <coughs> these are fundamentals. When Umar radiallahu anhu, I'll finish here. When Umar radiallahu anhu was passing away, the rations mentioned that when he was... You can bring me a note. When Umar radiallahu anhu was passing away, Narration mentioned that he was stabbed by Abu Lu'lu and he became unconscious. And when he gained consciousness, the first thing he asked the people, because he was leading the Fajr Salah, he said, Have the people prayed? He said, Yes. And I was said, Good, because in this deed, there's no place for that person who does not pray. There's no place for that person who does not pray. And then Umar had been stabbed a number of times and Umar radiallahu anhu said, bring me the water. They brought him water, he did wuhu, he did wuhu, and then he prayed. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, after all this, he told Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, Abdullah, go and ask the people, is there anybody that Umar has oppressed? Well, let them take their revenge today. It is easier for me that they take their revenge today than on the day of judgment. Abdullah ibn Abbas says, he went around, he said, I swear by Allah, every group of people I went to, they were crying like they had lost their own child. And they were saying that we wish that we could give our lives for Umar ibn Khattab And then he came and he told Umar radiallahu anhu, and then Umar radiallahu anhu, subhanAllah, the Sahaba were coming in and he was crying. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, he said, Umar ibn Abbas, why are you crying for by Allah, the Messenger of Allah left this dunya, and he was pleased with you. 
Abu Bakr left his dunya and he was pleased with you. Why are you crying for? He said, I know the Prophet was pleased with me and Abu Bakr was pleased with me. But what concerns me is this matter, the Khalifat. The Khalifat concerns me, me being a Khalif. Maybe I will stand in for Allah and Allah will say that you were unjust, O Umar. And you didn't care about the people of Umar. And then Umar said, and you know the virtues of Umar, he said, I swear by Allah, if I could leave this dunya with having no good virtues and no, and no evil deeds, I would be satisfied. And then Abdullah Mir, Abbas radiallahu said, Amir al I will bear testimony for you on the day of judgment that you were an upright man. And Umar sat up and he touched him on his shoulder and he said, Will you bear testimony for me? And he said, I will bear testimony for you. And then the narration mentioned that Umar anhu was lying in the lap of his son, Abdullah ibn Umar. And he said to Abdullah, he said, Abdullah, place my cheek on the floor. And Abdullah anhu kissing the forehead of his father, he placed his cheek on the ground. And he said, why, oh my father? Why? And Umar said, because if Umar is destined for Jannah, <coughs> then the pillows of Jannah are softer than your thigh. And if Umar is destined for Jahannam, then you don't want the Jahannam in your thigh. And then Umar said, when you, when you, when I die, and you give me the kafir, be moderate in the kafir. Don't make expensive shroud. Because if Allah has Jannah for Umar, then Allah will give Umar better shrouds than this. And if Umar is destined for Jahannam, then Allah will strip me of this as well. And then he said, be moderate in digging my grave. Because if Umar, if Allah has destined Jannah for Umar, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expand his grave. And if Allah has destined Jahannam for Umar, then even this is not enough. And then he said to his son Abdullah and Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Abdullah, go to Aisha radiallahu anha, give her my salams. And don't say Amir al-Mu'mineen, but today the believers don't have an Amir. And I ask her if I can be buried next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr. And she went, and she went, and he went, and he knocked on the door. And Aisha radiallahu anha was crying at that moment. And, and then he asked, he said, Umar radiallahu anhu gives salams. And he's asking, could you be buried next to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr? And she said, I reserved this place for myself, but one was my husband and the other was my father. But I give this to Umar Allah. Umar came back, and Umar was lying down, and Umar said, sit me up. And they sat him up. And he, said, and, and he came in, and he said, Umar al-Mu'mineen, your wish has been granted. And then Umar radiallahu anhu said, he said, when I die, and you are going to take me to bury me, ask Aisha again. Because maybe she felt compelled because of my station amongst the Muslims. And then, when Umar radiallahu anhu passed away, radiallahu anhu, they went and they buried him next to the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah. What a... <coughs> you get, you leave your home with the intention of killing the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And eventually you are buried at the feet of the Prophet But irrespective brothers and sisters, the truth is, I've been giving talks many years, you know, I've passed the stage of just giving uh, narratives. What we take from the life of Umar al Khattab is that we want to be like Umar al Khattab. What we take from the life of Khadija is that we want to be like Khadija. We want to be like Fatima. We want to be like Abu Bakr. We want to be like Khalid and Walid. That's what we want to be. And that's what we need. Muslim, we need Muslims as leaders. We need Muslims who are motivated. We need Muslims with a vision. With a vision, with a concern. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who live and die for his sake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in dunya. May Allah reunite us in general. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.